Well, hey guys, welcome back to Rude Talk, episode number four. It's good to have you here, Mats and Barbara. And to Mats, I want to congratulate you for your birthday yesterday, one day late. Oh. I know, <laughs> but I know that uh, you had birthday yesterday. I'm not sure how old you turned, but uh, happy birthday, Thank belated you. one. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's 38, Casper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kaspar, uh, for, uh, for taking the time. You're in New York already, and uh, we've seen you had a, a crazy um, sporty summer playing hockey on the court, land hockey, actually, with Hubert uh, Hurkacz. You played a bit of golf as well a couple of days ago. Uh, I mean, do you still have time to prepare for the Grand Slam? You're so pleased. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I've figured out or realized that this sport uh, is so much tennis and sometimes a bit too much, I think. But uh, that's how it goes. We are traveling everywhere and playing a new tournament almost every week. So any time or any day off you can get doing something else is good for your mind. And uh, I like to disconnect with other sports. So uh, it's been fun. I just came from a weekend of golf in uh, close to Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, which was sort of halfway on on the way to New York from Cincinnati. So we drove there five hours, slept there two, three nights, played 72 holes of golf and then drove into the city yesterday morning. So uh, enough golf for this summer, I think. And now it's time to focus on only tennis the rest of the, the stay here in the States. Can, about it, can I throw it yeah. in? Because, because my Please. kids, especially my one son, Kasper, Eric, is... Uh, yeah. He's born in 1997, and he's like, okay. ask him about his golf. Ask him about his golf. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna ask him about his golf. So, so tell me, because I played a lot of golf too. What, what is it? Because some players, oh, it's too tiring, and it's too... What does golf in specific do for your tennis, so to speak? Well, I think... This weekend was pretty special because uh, I played with uh, one of my best friends who, was, who came here with me or with us to this trip. Uh, he's a good tennis player and golf player and my father also. So it's very, very, very competitive. And uh, <laughs> we said before, we always, because anytime I meet someone, I don't know, back in Norway or whatever, when we are all three together and everyone asks us like, who is the better golfer? So we have kind of made this deal that whoever wins the more rounds during a year and whoever has the lowest round during the year has the bragging rights to say that uh, he's the best golfer. So <laughs> this trip, we were playing 72 holes, which is normal tournament. In a tournament, golf tournament, you play 72 holes for, uh, over four days. We played over two days, so it was very intense. And wow. every single shot counted. We counted all the shots. And we said before the, the weekend that this weekend, this short golf trip will count or matter the most for this year's bragging rights of who's the best golfer. <laughs> so it was so intense and so nerve wracking from the first to the last shot that uh, it's been a while since I uh, felt that much pressure actually. And uh, wow. in the end, I can say that I was able to win. I won by three shots over both my friend and my father. They shared second place, three shots oh. behind me. So it was a very close and very tight uh, competition. Wow. And it was only came down to on. three shots. It still goes still, on until still the end goes of the on, year, but right? At least for now, I have the bragging rights to say that this year I was the better golfer. <laughs> and then next year we have to go again and start restart everything. Because after this trip, you know, in Norway, it gets too cold to play golf. So uh, yeah. it's not much golf the next month. So I think we've done, uh, done enough on the golf course this year. So uh, it was fun, but it was also nerve wracking. So I'm not sure if it's... I can take too much things from golf to tennis in terms of technical stuff, but at least pressure-wise, uh, I'm coming into <laughs> US Open having felt and Prepared. dealt with a lot of pressure. <laughs> well, so mentally, I don't think you're going to be... Babsi, what do you think? Casper is going to be bragging? I don't think he knows what bragging no. means. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe at home in your family house, Casper. <laughs> yes. maybe, maybe he's, you know, behind closed doors. People sometimes are a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so it's tennis it's golf are there under other sports you like to do during uh during summertime uh, like um, table tennis or i don't know hiking or skiing cross-country skiing for you by yeah maybe. i love doing anything that contains you no know, ball like a ball sport so um i mean 
every morning in my warm up routine, we throw some like American football to each other and to warm up the shoulder, and then we have a football to jiggle around a little bit with. So I I love just challenging myself and my the, the the people in my team and you know easy stuff and easy exercises. We have small competitions all the time, so uh, it's anything that contains a ball. But tennis and golf are my biggest passions, and um, other sports is is you know maybe physically a little bit tougher than golf yeah. because especially in the states you can drive around it's pretty easy going if you play golf in the states it's not physically challenging like maybe mm. if you play a game of basketball or whatever with friends you will mm. actually be pretty tired so to disconnect i think find golf very very uh, great <laughs> for me how important is it really on a serious note to play other sports because you learn about tennis through hitting a golf ball, through course management, to cross country ski, to team sports. What do you think? Is it necessary to play two or three different sports growing up? Um, it's not necessary, but I believe it helps. And I think specializing in, in one sport should maybe start when you're starting like your puberty in a way, or like when you when you're sort of becoming a teenager 12 13 mm -hmm. 14 that that kind of year span i think is that's where i when i did it at least i did soccer and um, ice hockey and golf besides tennis until i was 12 so i was always you know a practice every afternoon either it was tennis you know golf or soccer or whatever it was always something to go to after school so i was always very active as a young young kid and then i i really enjoyed it and but i did enjoy most of tennis and that's why i chose it uh so but when i was 12 i said that i wanted to quit with the other ones to only focus on tennis so and i'm happy that i did the other ones because it has given me a lot of joy now in later in life and um so that i have something else to do other than just you know <laughs> tennis and uh watching series or whatever so I, I like being active and especially, like I said, in, you know, in the beginning of any sport that contains, you know, some sort of ball skills or ball handlings or whatever you, I, I enjoy it. So even if mm. it's, you know, just going for bowling or whatever one night, I find it, uh, I take it as a challenge and I want to be the best. <laughs> Babsi, I asked you too, yeah. what do you think of that today? Yeah, story? you know, I think, I think it is important, uh, as Kasper said, to a certain age to do lots of uh, different sports. I think it sets the foundation physically as well. You know, if you um, do a lot of sports with a ball, if you, if you play golf and you, you learn things so, or so quickly when, when you're young as well. And I've been doing a lot of sports when I was uh, uh, growing up as well, hiking, skiing, cross country skiing, um, all that stuff um, as well. Golf, I started a little bit later um, as well, but I think it, it's really important. And I love that here in Australia, for example, our son is 13 and they have so much sport at school. They get exposed to so much sport and like you can see uh, how how much that uh, that helps uh, them develop physically as well so i'm all for it and at some stage of course i think you have to um you have to uh, go with one sport and and focus on that one but once yeah. you've done a lot of other things you can do that for the rest of your life so mm. um it's pretty cool you guys have to try to start uh, you have to try uh, paddle tennis i th i think that's uh, so much fun to play as well okay and, uh, yeah have you have you tried it casper yeah, I tried it a couple of times. It's very fun and social and you are four on the court, obviously. And um, it's uh, easy for tennis players to catch it and kind of understand. But it's also tough to realize that you have walls that kind of help you a little bit. So when I play, I, I, I just it's tough for me to accept that the ball will pass me and come from behind. You know, it's uh, I know <laughs> try to take everything on volleys. So. <laughs> I'm not like uh, it's it's uh, tennis has ruined me I guess for paddle tennis but I think it's fun anyways. <laughs> yeah, it's good, Mats. We have to we go have to go and play uh, a, a game at some stage. You'd love it. You would really yeah. love it. <laughs> All right, uh, Kaspar, let's talk about uh, your summer results. Now, uh, you won the tournament in uh, Stad. You did not come to Kitzbühel, which is another, I have to yeah, be a little bit mad with you there. Um, you yep. played semis in, in Montreal, Cincinnati, probably a bit of a, a surprise. You lost the first round there. Uh, how would you summarize the, the summer of tennis for you? I think it has been honestly a good one. Not exactly sim the same as last year, but... Uh... When you look at, you know, results and the points that I've gained, it's close to what I did last summer. So 
I'm maybe a little bit short or a little bit behind. But then again, US Open wasn't great for me last year. So I feel like this is a good chance for me coming into this tournament with having lost early in Cincinnati, sort of wanting some revenge. And I get a full week of great practice now before the tournament starts. And um, I think it's going to be hopefully good. And uh, I'm happy with the summer. I was able to win the tournament in Gestad and defend my title. You know, it was a very tough final against uh, Matteo. Yeah. It was... Uh, long one and coming from behind and was close to losing that match so that was really that one tasted really really good and um yeah i mean i'm happy with it sort of and also some disappointments but at the end of the day i think that's uh i think i realized that every year i will another year i play on tour i will face you know certain matches that don't go my way and uh, sort of, there will always be some matches that you feel like ah oh, I shouldn't have lost that one and maybe Cincinnati was one of those but uh, let's hope it's uh, one of the last ones of the year where I feel have that feeling afterwards <laughs> yeah you got it out of the way now which is good you know US Open mm -hmm. uh, bring it on uh, we have to talk and uh, that's to both of you as well we have to talk about the, the topic the off-court coaching now uh, this is in place for pretty much a month now uh, Kasper, you start first. Uh, what's what's your feedback here now after this month? Have you enjoyed it? Have you used it? Uh, what about the other players? What do players talk in the locker room? Yeah, no, I mean it's it's just sort of helpful for the coaches, I think. And um, the thing is, it's not when I was asked about it like a month ago, I said that I don't think it will change too much because you know. In between points, we have the 25-second rule. So you can't stay and talk with your coach for more than maybe five seconds because you need the rest of the time you need to prepare for the next point, either if it's getting in a couple balls or you know, wiping off your sweat or whatever, or just if you have your routine before at any point. So I did say that uh, it's not going to be long discussions or long conversations with your coach, which I think yeah, has been right because when I was in Montreal, I was playing, I think it was in the semifinals. I was. I lost the second set against Hubert and then he went out to, to change his clothes um, uh, after because it was quite hot and he was, he was sweating. So he needed to change everything and it takes about five minutes. So mm -hmm. after sitting down for like two, three minutes on the bench, I went up to, you know, move around a little bit. And then I went down to the corner where my box or my team were sitting and we started, you know, chatting a little bit about you know, what can I do better or what should I think about or hmm. or all these things. And then the umpire actually came down and said, you can't be having long conversations. It's only like three, four second conversations. That's the coaching oh, right. rule. Okay. So I was like, oh, I didn't know actually. So no, I, I think that's, that that's pretty fair. So I yeah. just thought that it was an open dialogue for as long as you wanted, as long as you kept your time. But actually it's only like, yeah, they keep it very strict and say that you can't really go there and talk to your coach for more than four or five seconds at a time. So I think that's, um, I'm not sure if it's helping the sport or ruining the yeah, sport. Yeah, does it change you, the outcome yeah. of, of, of the match, uh, you think? Not really. It's just sort of, um, uh, what should I say? Nice knowing that your coach can talk a little bit to you without feeling that you're like, oh, I'll get a warning now or whatever. So yeah, I think it's, fair and um i think uh, yeah i don't see any negative sides with it honestly mm. Mm. matt uh, i mean you've we've been following tennis uh, closely and i'm sure you kept an eye on that uh, as well your thoughts on it i don't think we've ever discussed it if you like it or not have we i don't not think we ever... now no, it's your time we haven't really discussed it and i have to say that the way that um I'm not sure that I like the way that, and I know that you're very become partial to this, the WTA tour where the coach comes and sits next to you on the court. I don't, that I don't really like. I understand that we get coached pretty much all the time. And I'm sure Casper, you can look at your father and you, and he can look you in the eye and you know exactly what he's thinking. So it must yeah. doesn't say anything. Uh, and I think there's a lot of relationships like that, of course, but I don't necessarily, I think that we, it's becoming, let's hold on to that tennis is a sport that is, you make the decisions, it's an individual sport, that is the beauty of our sport and it doesn't happen in other, in other sports the same way. So let's not um, expose ourselves to having a coach sit next to you on the bench so that it looks like, oh, Christian Rue just won before his son, 
Casper because he couldn't think for himself. I think that the image is not a good image. I think mm. we need to be individuals, but I think that it doesn't really matter. And if it's three, four seconds, um, yeah. most players have a relationship with their coaches where they look at them and they give them one sign and they know exactly what they're doing. And, and again, how much can the coaches help or hurt? So I don't mind. I have changed my mind a little bit, Bob. See, I, I don't mind. I just think it's the way it needs to be done uh, yeah. Yeah. to present it. It mustn't look like the coach is in Davis Cup sitting there telling you exactly yeah. what this is what you need to do i don't like that look but i really don't mind anymore hopefully it helps the sport yeah we'll uh, keep a close eye on that uh, it's time to talk about news what's happened uh, in the tennis world kasper now it looks like novak djokovic uh, he can't enter uh, america he won't be able to play um the us open uh, what's uh, does he get support from other players what's the talk in the in in the, the locker rooms and are you disappointed not to see him in the draw personally yeah well i mean it's an individual sport so all the players will think about themselves you know firstly but uh so it's not too much talk honestly i only went to the the site yesterday first time and i was late there so it wasn't too many people anyways but uh i think it's yeah it's sad that politics will get in his way or these rules will get in his way um, again he's chasing, yeah he's chasing you know rafa with one more ahead of him with the grand slam count and uh, he's chasing history so i mean and i do think that it could honestly go under the best interest of the country because he has won there many times before and he will bring a big crowd to the stadium and to the tournament. So you can definitely argue that it's in the best interest of the country. It's not a politician or whatever, but he is a big mm. superstar and uh, he would bring a lot of attention to the tournament. Having him and Rafa, for example, in the final would be so epic because everyone knows what's on the line, for example. Mm. So I do think that it's very sad and... And, um, yeah, for me personally, maybe I, I'm not crying about it, but I do think as a, a colleague or another player that it's sad that politics will get in his way for chasing yeah. history. So, I mean, that's uh, definitely something all players can, I think, re relate to and feel sorry for him for. Uh, Mats, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you read the statement from, uh, not a statement, but it's just a tweet from Taylor Fritz where he said, uh, at, at least it's good for every other player if Novak is not in the draw because uh, they know if Novak is playing, there's a very good chance that he's going to win uh, win the yeah. title at the US Open. So I thought that was uh, yeah. that was pretty funny. And that's true. Maybe as an individual, you know, you do think like that a little bit as well. But your thoughts on uh, uh, Novak not being able to play, Mats? That was the exact question, Bob. So you're amazing. Oh. We think it like after the, after so many years. Yeah, so it's really like together, it's like a really. married couple. It's not a, it's not a good sign. <laughs> not um, a good sign. No, I was going to ask you, Casper, because I did a, 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 a couple of hours today of interviews for Eurosport uh, for uh, journalists from uh, all over Europe. And they asked me that question, everyone, like, oh, well, is it a, you know, is it disappointing? And do the other players... You know, well, if I win, Novak is not here. Of course, surely it doesn't really matter once the tournament starts for you guys because you have played so many majors and everybody has. Rafa hasn't played Wimbledon all the time. Ivan Lendl wasn't playing the French one year because he wanted to focus on Wimbledon in my day. What do you, I mean, it doesn't affect you at all. Right? It doesn't make you feel like Dominic team when he won against Zverev. Does he ever think about that Rafa didn't play and that Roger didn't play and that Novak was defaulted? Surely not, no? No, I don't think so. But this is a special case, obviously, because of yeah. its, um, poli like politics or whatever. And I don't think you should mix politics and sport because it makes a bad outcome. So yeah, it's been a strange year when it comes to the Grand Slams. And then for him, it's been so unfortunate. <laughs> He won Wimbledon, but didn't even get points for it. So he's been so unlucky when it comes to the slams this year. And he's defending <laughs> three out of four. So, I mean, you can't, uh, you know, make that up sort of. And then, you know, he has this tournament where he sort of probably wants a revenge for what happened last year in the final. And then he's not able to come. So, and it's like I said, when it comes to politics, I think you definitely could argue that um, he's in the best interest of the country to come. Obviously, he's not vaccinated and... Yes, that's maybe not good for spreading the virus, but I think we're at this point now where, I mean, <laughs> it's many cases everywhere anyway. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if people really, you know, think about it as much anymore. So, 
course, I'm trying to stay away from two big crowds and all these things, not to get sick if in front of the tournament, but uh, or during the tournament. But uh, I don't right. see him as a threat to the public, uh, even though he's not vaccinated still. So I'm I'm not sure about uh, what's the right solution. But it's sad and uh, for the sport and the tournament. But yeah, I mean, it's like also like Taylor said, he's probably the biggest threat to win. So if he's not here, I mean, the other players will feel like oh. This is maybe a good chance to do a, having a good result, or you know, the the best player is not here. So I mean, it's a little bit more open. You can think so. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's mixed feelings, I guess. But uh, yeah. in the end, I feel sorry for him, and he's uh, he's won here many times and has been in so many finals. He has lost some some tough finals, but he has also won the tournament. So it's um, it's like yeah. I said, sad that politics gets in his way. Uh, let's talk a little bit more tennis. In Cincinnati, we had some uh, surprising victories. I'm, I'm sure you followed yeah. that. We have two players from Follies, Caroline Garcia and Borna Chorich, who have won. Do you feel it's more and more open for non-seeded players these days to win a title? Yes, for sure. And um, How come? I, I think I said it many times, actually, in interviews before that, you know, When, you know, one sad day where Rafa, Novak and Roger is not here anymore, I think that it will be a little bit more open and more players will win slams and ATP 1000 events than what has happened the last 18 years or 17, 18, 19 years. So they have been dominating so much that it's ridiculous. It's on another mm -hmm. level. So um, it's tough to compete with that, obviously. But uh, like I said, there will be a sad day where, they're not here anymore and then I think it's going to be a little bit more open and I think we've seen it this year with people winning ATP thousands or thousand tournaments we had Fritz uh, in Indian Wells Carlos has won two of course and then mm. Novak won Rome and then we had uh, Pablo and Corich now um, the last two ones so that shows that uh, anyone can have a good week and if the big three are not here, they're not going to stop the, whoever has a good week because in the end, they will one of the three will stop whoever has that good week, uh, at least the last 17, 18 years, it feels like. So if they're not there, the one who has a better week is probably going to end up winning, I guess. Mm. Is it because the game is just a little bit faster every year, you think, Casper, that, that the, it's, it's just it becomes a little bit like, more like the PJ Tour or golf, where anyone can win it because it's so close and everybody hits it hard. And is it what's happening in tennis? That it's more physical and therefore the margins are smaller? Could be, yeah. And I think just, I think we just have to, the young generation accept or, and also respect what the big three guys have done and how yeah. sort of good they have been. And I don't think we will see that dominance in some time um, like they have shown and and I think like this these days you have like 30 40 players who has like a top level their top level is so good that they can beat anyone um, mm. and uh, but then again I think sort of what should I say like the worst level of the big three has still been good enough to kind of stop whoever has that uh, great week or that top level you know Especially in the Grand Slams, in best of five sets, it requires a lot to beat them in best of five sets. But yeah, I mean, uh, you see, Corich, I always found him a very, very good player. He's physically strong and good backhand, great return, great mover. So there's no reason why he shouldn't win the ATP 1000 if you think about it that way. Uh, he has all the quality or stuff, at least in my eyes. And then same with Pablo Carreño. He's a great player, great fighter. He's been around for many years. So It's fun to see these kind of stories where either a player like Pablo Carreño, who has turned 30, I think he turned turned 30 last year or in the beginning of this year and winning his biggest title now and Courage coming back from injury, showing that he has the level to, to do this. So I think it's fun and it's exciting for the sport. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the depth is just uh, outrageous, I think. Babsi, yes. this is a good friend of yours. You want to know a record that you're going to impress people. If you know this statistic, you're going to impress yeah. a lot of people. Tell me. Who was the last player to win a Challenger and a Master Series tournament the same year? And when was it? You're not going to guess it, so I'm going to tell you straight away. It's Mikael <laughs> Perrenfors from <laughs> Sweden in 1993. Won oh, the wow. Canadian Open. And then he also won a challenger. And of course, that's exactly what Borna Chorich has done. I mean, that says it all about the sport wow. of professional tennis, yeah. that you, 
that you can do both. I mean, that's yeah. exactly what's happening in golf, right? Yeah, and I think that also shows goes to show like how tough actually the Challenger yeah. Tour is. And I was playing Challenger tournaments for three, four years before I was able to move on to the ATP Tour. And the battle there is just something else because everyone wants to make it to the top 100 or top 50 or whatever, and they are giving it all in every single match. So mm -hmm. sometimes on the ATP Tour, you meet a player who is, you know, maybe had a good result last week and is sort of happy with that result and doesn't really care too much about the match you're about to play against him or he's a little bit injured yeah. or whatever you can get some sort of free matches or free points here and there but on the challenger tour it's like um it's a battle really? every every match and you see courage mm. he wanted he won a thousand but he has lost challenger matches this year mm. you know several yeah. of them so it just shows like you know there's a group of even 200 players that can play really really good tennis and uh Unfortunately, the way the sport is set up, I don't think the guys from 100 to 200 get enough or good enough attention or yeah. you know, respected enough because they are great players. And uh, if you have number 180 in the world in soccer, he's making tens of millions every year, while a uh, number 180 tennis player in the world is barely making it throughout the year, you know, with expenses mm -hmm. that he has. So it's... Uh, mm -hmm. I think that also is something that hopefully one day can change a little bit and improve for for those guys, for for that uh, yeah the people in that sort of range or span on mm -hmm. the rankings at least. Yeah, the air is definitely getting thinner and thinner. I've noticed yeah. that as well. Now we have a debate, guys. Um, Serena Williams. She announced that the U.S. Open. She's gonna call it quits afterwards. Uh, she doesn't want to say she's retiring, but she is evolving to someone else. Um, oh, she is officially, this is officially her last tournament. She has yes. said that. Yes, okay, because I wasn't that, sure. Yeah. Like, I was, okay. Yep, yep this is it. And uh, my question is to both of you, Kasper, I start with you. Is Serena the GOAT for you in women's tennis? Uh, for me, yes, because I didn't live to experience Steffi or the other ones that have won, you know, a similar amount of slams. Uh, and I just watched King Richard the other day uh, for the oh, first yes. time. How so I like thought it? it was a really, really cool story. And my father actually went to Rick Macy Academy as well. So he, th he told me a oh. bunch of fun, fun stories. Go. And he actually practiced with them a couple of times when they were like 13 and 15 or, or something like this. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's a cool story. And for me, yes, I think, I think she's because she's the one I grew up watching on the women's side, winning all the, all the tournaments. And I'm not sure how many slams they have, you know, including doubles and the both sisters, but it's uh, more than 30, I guess. So hmm. I think that oh, the, yeah. the father did, did something right. <laughs> <laughs> Mats, your thought, what do you think? Is she the GOAT or what? Because a lot of people think it's uh, Steffi Graf because she won uh, 22 Grand Slam titles in a shorter period of time. Um, so, so what do you think? Um... And she won Olympics and the four yes. slams in 1988, the Golden Slam. Correct. Um, yep. But I think that the more we, the more that this saga of uh, Rafa and, uh, well, I don't know if Roger can be even, but Rafa Novak and Roger, the goat between them, with all that's happening to Novak, I feel like that race is, it's becoming a little bit irrelevant because he's not allowed to play. And I do think we're going to talk about the greatest big three players on the men's side of all time happening to play during the same time. I think that's what we're going to remember. Let's mm. talk 20, 30 years. When we're not around, Bob, when Casper is sitting in his rocking chair back in Norway <laughs> with all the trophies and his dad is yeah, smoking a pipe. No, but I think Serena is that for me. I think that she, because of her sister, because of the story, because of where uh, they came out of uh, in Los Angeles, um, and I have to say, because of African-American and not being that common, I think the whole package makes her mm -hmm. the GOAT and the most uh, transcendent player that took women's tennis and put it into the living room of not just women, but sports fans in general. Oh, we got to watch the Williams sisters. I mm -hmm. think that she is the GOAT because of what she's done to the game. And I actually think that she needs to be admired because of the length of her career. Uh, yeah, and yeah, not to push it in in 10 years. She's unbelievable. She's been playing for 23 years. 
on top. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, the I played her, against her in 1999. No, I didn't play. I played the same at the US Open when she won it. I played there. It's crazy. And I've, re I've been retired for 18 years. So but I just, also, I just last thing, phenomenal. when Serena is in the draw, even at this year's Wimbledon, I found myself answering the question, oh, can Serena win her? Well, she's in the draw. If she can serve well, you know, she can serve mm -hmm. everybody off the shit's the ball heart. And I don't, I never had that feeling about Martina Navratilova or Chris Abbott or Steffi Graf. When they got towards the end of the career, it was kind of like, no, no, they cannot win anymore. They're overpowered, whatever. With Serena, I still feel maybe now, but I'm like, oh, watch out because the way she plays. So I think that tells me that, yes, I think she's the greatest of all time. I really do. I don't think there's a question in my mind. And, yeah, and how sure. much uh, does the, the personality come into this debate about the GOAT as well? I mean, you know that yeah. Serena uh, Kasper has a, a huge personality, the way uh, she acts on the court, you know, how outgoing she is. Uh, she's very emotional as well. She throws a leg up. She yells, she <laughs> screams, she's teary. Yeah. She's not. Um, I mean, that's also something. Steffi Graf had no emotions, really. She was very calm. She was a, a, a lady on the on the court. Yep. I wouldn't say that Serena is not a lady. Don't get me wrong, but very, very different out there. How much does that come into uh, play when we talk about the goat? For sure, and she's been passionate all her career, and she still is because she's, you know. Uh, gave birth to a child some years ago and she's still here like she doesn't need to she's done everything there is in the sport but she's still here and she still wants probably to win and i do hope that she wins this tournament that she's going to play now in the u.s open it would be an epic way to sort of end her career to win yeah and it's like Matt says i think i believe that she can because i know like her potential and i know her highest level so i do actually hope she does um so it's going to be interesting to follow and I do think just the name like Serena is powerful. Mm. And just when you hear Serena around the world, everyone knows who you're talking about because it's Serena Williams and she's, uh, yeah, brings mm. even power to her name. So, yeah, it's passion, it's sports, it's power, it's, uh, yeah, it's everything. So for me, for sure, yeah, she's, um, it's more, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's her, uh, that's the goal for me. That's just to plain and simple. All right, boys, are you ready for a quiz, a Serena quiz? Yeah, sure. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to alternate the questions. I'm going to start with okay. Casper. It's an easy one first up. Uh, ten questions, five each, and then we'll see who uh, uh, can brag about this uh, winning this, this quiz then as well. Maybe you have a second one yeah. to brag about then, Casper. All right. Yeah. So first, a top ten win for Serena. And I'll give you some options. Is it or was it uh, Monica Selesh? Was it uh, against Mary Pierce? Was it against Irina Spilea, who you probably have never heard of? Or Steffi Graf? Who did she beat? <laughs> who was her first top ten win? That's not easy. Uh, no. <laughs> it's not. Not easy. I thought you were going to say, like, how many slams has she won or something like this. <laughs> no, I mean, that would be too easy. We're not thinking the guys, I, was here, probably, guys. I, was, I was probably not even born to my defense, but... Uh, no, it actually happened 1997. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there you go. I wasn't <laughs> even thought of, probably. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so what are you... I, I think you have to take a guess. Yeah, just, I'm just going to go oh, for the want the hint? Oh, no, I'm going to go yeah, for no, Monica he... Seles. Eh, wrong. wrong. It was Mary yeah. Pierce in Chicago, okay. 1997. That was, that okay. was the top one. Okay. All yeah. right, Mats. Um, Serena is married to, married to Alexis or Hanian. Or Hanian is a co-founder of which company? Is it uh, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, or Twitter? Reddit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that was actually the easier one, wasn't it? Much that was easier. Yeah. I, I yes, knew that <laughs> <laughs> Much easier. <laughs> All right, Casper. Uh, which player prevented Serena Williams the four Grand Slam in the same year at the US Open 2015 in the semifinals? Was it um, Flavia Benetta who he lost, who, who she lost to? Was it Roberta Vinci, Simona Halep, or Venus Williams? Oh God, you don't know, do you? I thought it was. I thought Azarenka was going to be on there, but I'm going to. No, go no. For... It, Flavia Panetta won the title that year, and then but, uh, there's I'm Roberta Min Vinci in the mix. Yeah, because the they played the final, didn't they? Uh -huh. Vinci and Panetta. Uh -huh. So either Panetta or Vinci then. 
Yeah, that's good. The 50-50 joker. <laughs> and I actually, I, I spoke to a, a journalist before and I said, I put my house on that Serena is going to win this match against this uh, particular person in the semifinals because just of the game style. Yes. <laughs> and I was I'm wrong. Go I lost for... my house. I'm, then I'm going to go for Roberta Vinci. Nice. Yes. Well done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Max. Uh, um, oh. I, Barbara Shett, played a three matches against Serena and I have never beaten her. But how many sets have I taken off her in those three matches, Mats? Okay, let's see. Was it see. zero? Was it one? Was it two? Or was it three? Okay, so do I want to be right? Or do I want to have you bitch at me for two weeks at the US Open? Let's see. <laughs> well, it's up to you. Yeah. I mean, you're... No, no, no. I'm going to be, I'm gonna be right. I actually think you took a set off of her. I did, yeah. I did once at the Canadian <laughs> Open. Believe it or not, I was up a set, and then I she just okay. <laughs> nice. I was like, this is right. enough winning a set against her. I'm happy with that. <laughs> All right. So, wow, is it two points for you, Mats? Now two one. Yeah. Two points for you. Two one. All right, Casper. Uh, Serena Williams has lived most of her life in Florida, Florida, but where was she born? And you just watched the movie, so you should know that. Was it in Linwood, California? Or was it in Scottsdale, Arizona? It could have also been in Sargino in Michigan or in Newark in New Jersey. Well, they grew up in Compton. So that's sort of, that's California and Los Angeles, I believe. So I'm going to go for, oh, you're doing something with your mouth that I'm probably wrong. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm doing something with my mouth. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna go. For I didn't Arizona. know. I honestly Ari didn't know that. I Arizona would have said then. the same. Mm -hmm. Arizona, then. No. Okay. Yeah, the the the, the Sar Sargino, Michigan. I didn't know. Wow. That. I had no idea. Yeah. But they wow. grew up in Sargino. That's yeah. where they were born. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did not All know right. That. No, didn't know that either. I hope the reason. That's not. The that's not, that's not, not in the movie. <laughs> I have no, to say, your questions are much tougher. Uh, the movie starts with uh, her and uh, Venus playing in Compton in this, yeah, easy going club with like two courts or whatever with their father in the rain or at least one of the. Yeah, one of the yeah that's right. Oh. Um, yeah. Matt's next question uh, What is Serena's middle name? Is it Star? Is it uh, Jamaica? Is it Aisha or Isha? Or is it Sloan? The clock is ticking. I have no idea, but I'm assuming that it's... Did you say star? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I think so. Venus is the sister. <laughs> no? Wrong. It's, it's Jamaica. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, you made a mistake. Good. Wow. Um, oh, and this, this one is a That's good cool. one for you, Casper. Uh, As a kid, Serena Venus attended a famous Floridan tennis academy. Which one was it? You know that you've said it before. Rick Macy, and, tennis academy. Yeah, there you go. Another point for you. It's two yeah. all, I think. Is it yep. two all or three two? two yeah, all. two all. But he's two got all. one more question now. <laughs> all right, Matt. Uh, which player did Serena Williams face the most in her career? Was it Venus? Was it uh, Victoria Azarenka, Maria Sharapova, or Martina Hingis? Um. Maria Sharapova. Wrong. Eh. Hey! She faced Venus 31 times. Wow. No, I didn't realize that. Because I saw only a few. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Imagine playing yeah. your sister. I know. Yeah, 31 <laughs> times. Oh. Oh, that That's would be horrible, horrible for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. You know. Okay, then, Casper. Uh, um, Serena Last Williams one. has won 23 Grand Slam titles in singles, but how many did she win in doubles, including mixed doubles? Did she oh. win 11, 16, 22, or 27? <laughs> All together or in? Yes, uh, in mixed doubles and in doubles. Oh, okay. Uh... Grand and, slams. Oh, I think it's probably yeah. either 11, 11 or 16. I don't, I don't think it's more than 20, but I'm going to oh, go for you, 11. That's pretty 11, good. 11. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. You still have time to change. Uh, <laughs> won't be more. You can't have won more than 11. She yeah, won 16. 
What? She won How many 14, of them in doubles? She won 14 with Venus. Okay. That's okay, last question. Mats, you can, uh, you can win this can win. with this question. And you would have no idea. I know that. Serena Williams won six US Open. What color was her outfit when she won her third title in 2008? <laughs> Was it Purple. red? Was it gold? Was it blue? Or was it green? Not even. Uh, it was, hold on a second. Red, gold, green, and? And blue. <laughs> uh, Come on, you're a man blue. of fashion. It was blue. Wrong. Wrong. It was red. red. Oh. It was red. Yeah, it was red. Gold would have oh, been. It's a tie. Yeah, it's, it's a tie. It's a tie. It's a tie. It's a tie. Okay. Good. We, right, good. We, do yeah, we don't want to break your confidence, Casper. We no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. That's it for this yeah, thank uh, you. edition of the Root Talk. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah. We'll see you in New York, everyone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. see you in New York. Lucka till, Casper. Good luck, Casper. Yeah. Lucka till. And I uh, can't wait to see you play at the US Open. Seriously. Being thank fresh. You guys. And uh, yes, the bragging rights as well. <laughs> I'm going to talk to your father. I'm going to actually talk to your dad please, you please, for the first time in 10 years. Please ask my father how the golf went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will, for sure. Okay, good. Thanks, <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for now. Bye, guys. See you next Thank you so time. much.